Good afternoon and welcome to Making It Work. We're thrilled to see all of you here, our readers and subscribers. Your support drives us and fuels us and makes it uh, possible for us to deliver local journalism to you every day. So thank you for being a part of Making It Work and giving us your time today. Before we get started, I'd like to stand, extend our gratitude to our Making It Work sponsors. They are Cross Insurance, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Mimic. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Vice President of External Communications at Mimic, our friend Tony Payne. Tony. Thanks, Kate, and uh, welcome folks. I hope that you are going to enjoy yet again another Making It Work success uh, around uh, making sure that we are all succeeding in these very, very strange times. One of the things that we do at Memic um, as we serve our 18,000 main policyholders is to be sure that culture is something that uh, has right at the very top of the list, safety. Because if you're not working safely, you're, uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> and we, as your most likely insurance company for workers' compensation, uh, certainly don't want to ever see you showing up on our rolls as an injured worker. So please uh, enjoy today's uh, session with a, a very qualified panel, including our, our, own very, our very own Sarah Young, uh, and talk about, first and foremost, though, in that discussion, what does it mean to work safely? at home or simply work safely from wherever you are. Good luck. Thank you, Tony. And I love seeing everyone saying hello in the chat. Um, please let us know you're here. We had almost 200 people sign up to be with us today. So I'd love to say hi to Debbie Olkin from KMA Consulting and Suzette from Acadia Hospital in Bangor and Tiffany from Unum. It's great to see everybody um, giving us a little bit of a wave. Um, now I'd like to introduce Harvard Pilgrim's Vice President for Maine, Bill Whitmore. Bill. Hey, thanks, Kate. Uh, and thanks to uh, the Fulton Press Herald for all the effort to put on these events. Um, it's great. Um, we were talking this morning actually about this. We, we think you've actually extended your reach um, over the past several months and how you've been presenting these events. Also, thanks to the panelists um, for taking the time today to discuss this very timely topic. And thanks to Carol for, for moderating. Um, we all talk a lot about, or at least several of us have working at home, um, how we're still getting our work done while we're at home. And I think it's kind of the, the lights on work and we are being successful, but there are these less tangible things like uh, imparting our vision and our values uh, and our culture on our new employees. Those are things that I'm not sure, sure we're being quite so successful. So it would be really interesting to, to listen to what you have to suggest today. And, and just to note that a big part of our company's culture is our charitable uh, contributions and working with our communities. And I just wanted to note that since March, when, when most of us headed home to work, um, our company through our foundation has contributed over a million dollars to nonprofits in Maine to, to, that are dealing with helping us get through this pandemic. So, so thanks again, Kate and panelists and Carol. Um, looking forward to this. Bill, thank you so much. And we'd like to give a very deep thank you to Harvard Pilgrim for all your support of nonprofits at this time. And thank you for the note about our reach. Um, we've been really excited to host these webinars and and see that um, by removing location, we suddenly can involve so many more people. So I thank everyone for tuning in from IDEX and Coffee by Design and Forrester Research. It's really great to see people from all over the state and all over the country. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our esteemed panelists <laughs> and to the Press Herald Director of Special Projects, Carol Coltus. Carol. Thanks, Kate. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I don't think it's news that the pandemic has turned business as usual on its head. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in, in our Making It Work segments talking about how companies have innovated. And maybe not surprisingly, there are several companies that are still soldiering on and hiring and growing. And it occurred to us, how are those companies doing their onboarding and their training and welcoming new hires into their company culture? And so we reached out to three companies and asked if they would be willing to share their insight and their experience around that issue. And we got yeses from all the people we reached out to. So 
I'm delighted that they're here and that they will share what their experiences have been with the hope that you'll find something you can take away and apply to your business as well. So I'm going to introduce the panelists in just a second, but I wanted to just mention as far as today's format goes, our three panelists and I will be having a conversation for 30 or 40 minutes and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. Some of you filed questions when you registered for this, but if you wanna ask a question in, in live time, go to the bottom of your Zoom navigation bar, you'll see raise your hand, and you can ask your question that way. Strawberry Mosny, who is our IT specialist, will queue up the questions when we get to that uh, point in our conversation. Also, our Making It Work segments are recorded and they're posted on our landing page. So if you wanna replay this or you wanna share it with your social media feed, be our guest. So without any further ado, let me introduce our panelists. We have Meryl Fogg. She's vice president of member care for Grand Rounds, which is a healthcare technology company based in Lewiston. We have Sarah Young. She is the human resources business partner for Memic the unemployment compensation and safety company here based in Portland. You heard from Tony a little while ago, so you know what they're all about. And we have Beth Schweitzer. She is the senior manager of talent management and acquisition at Woodard and Curran, which is an engineering and consultancy firm based in Portland, but it has a national footprint, which I didn't realize until Beth and I had a chance to, to chat just before this event. So those are our panelists, and I'm going to ask the first question and toss it to Merrill, if you wouldn't mind being our first, uh, first respondent here, Merrill. So can you please sum briefly summarize how your normal new hire procedures changed once everyone began working from home? What was the most difficult part of that transi transition and how did you address it? So Merrill, why don't you take it away? Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me on today. Um, yeah, so the, the biggest change to state the obvious is that we went from doing mostly in person onboarding and a classroom based approach on our on site in Lewiston to being 100% virtual and remote. Um, so obviously a pretty significant change. Um, you know, I think fortunately Grand Rounds was well positioned to to make that change pretty easily. Um, you know, the last week in March, I think we onboarded something like 10 or 15 people, and that was our first class that was all remote. So it was a relatively large class. Um, but because we are an organization spread across Maine, Reno, San Francisco, as well as um, a number of colleagues uh, located across the country, we had really strong tools that are disposable to already sort of interact and engage with each other uh, remotely. Um, I think I think the ch most challenging thing, so we, so we moved to on uh, classroom based training, um, but online. The most challenging part, though, was, you know, we have a heavy culture of um, sort of peer to peer shadowing and, um, you know, really learning from others through observation. Um, and you sort of have a mentor as you as you grow and develop throughout the, the organization. And so trying to figure out how we adapted to that and did that virtually was a little bit more challenging um, and certainly took us a couple, probably a couple classes to get it right. Um, but now have settled into a routine and rhythm um, around that. But just sort of that in person connection that's so important, especially for new hires, replicating that virtually was was certainly a challenge that we felt. Um, uh, and, and something that we were really proactive in trying to address. And can you talk a little bit about, previously you had your new hires either go to Reno or to Lewiston for an immersive mm -hmm. uh, orientation and training session, right? So Correct. can you talk a little bit about how, how extensive that was and how it has, tra has transitioned to online? Yep, so um, those immersive programs would uh, range from uh, two to three weeks of onboarding. So, um, you know, where you're sort of sequestered in, in classrooms and then, um, uh, you know, with specialists and our training team, uh, and then would sort of gradually make your way into your, your actual role. Um, so we had to invest in some software and I, and I forgot the exact name to actually get all of the learning um, to be able to happen in a virtual classroom, essentially. Um, you know, we obviously leverage tools like Zoom and Google Hangouts to, to help facilitate that. Um, but so the team, interestingly, you know, some feedback as we've been just doing sort of um, 
you know, reviews with members who've gone through the uh, virtual training, it was really interesting to learn because some learning styles actually really benefited from online. It, it you know, people said that it was, it really enabled them to focus in. I think others missed that in-person connection, but I think just as an interesting learning, um, you know, and I think that probably a lot of employers are already seeing this with employees maybe looking to work from home permanently versus returning to the office. It, it just is an interesting point and, and sort of a forcing point to really kind of look at different styles in, in adult learning and, and also different approaches and, and preferences in terms of being in the office surrounded by people versus being independent and, and how that impacts productivity and encourages productivity in certain ways. So um, it's been an interesting learning uh, as, as we've been going as we've been going through this. And are you refining your onboarding and your training process as you get more of that information? Absolutely, yeah. So I'd say like we, we're pretty much, we're, we're very nimble. So we're a small enough organization that it's very easy for us to refine. Um, and, and I would say the onboarding approach. So little things like, you know, some, some things that felt really natural and organic when you're in person that are less natural and organic uh, when you're doing some virtual things. So making sure that we're putting together um, you know, stronger checklists or, or you know, um, kind of very explicit or, or uh, directive instructions for people who are doing the shadowing to make sure that they're covering off certain scenarios or are touching upon certain elements of the technology that, again, we j would just be easier to observe when you're in person. So um, certainly uh, changing changing those types of protocols, um, you know, we, we completely changed the way we deliver tools and technology in, in our software. So everyone gets a laptop, which is standard always for grand rounds, but um, thinking about in addition to the laptop, what other things we need to set them up for a home office. And, and that's now become a standard issue for the company. So everyone gets a monthly stipend so that they're able to support working from home. And, um, you know, it's, it, you know, we have them on the right internet speed and, and they have all the right equipment to really support them, um, whether it's multiple monitors or um, standing desks or whatever it is. So really trying to think about how we repurpose dollars that we would have spent on in-person engagements, um, you know, with the team to really make sure that people are outfitted for success and, and feel supported by the company. Great. Well, thank you. Beth, why don't you tell us how things are, are going at Woodard Curran? I think you told me that you had something like 275 new hires last year and you've got about 75 new hires so far this year. That's right. So um, we've actually been set up to support this new normal for lack of a better term, for some time. Um, we've been fortunate because there hasn't been a lot of change or impact we need to do with our processes to help support kind of the current environment right now. And so um, the biggest action that we've taken has been um, really just as Sarah had mentioned um, earlier, um, just to really look at our essential workforce, what we're going to need for hiring. So we have reduced that. But in the instances where we um, are moving forward, you know, it's critical for project delivery. Um, we work in water operations and those are all essential workers for us. Um, we continue to move forward in hiring. And so we've been able to customize what that looks like based on the business the new hire is entering. And so, for instance, um, where this, I think, is a little bit different than what Merrill was saying is that um, we never had an in-person new hire orientation per se. Mm -hmm. So for us, um, a lot of the burden on getting someone started is actually housed in the business directly with the hiring manager. And what we had already in place was oftentimes our hiring manager was not in the same location as our new hire. We've got um, presence in multiple states. We probably have close to 50 or so office locations and plant locations. And so um, that's where I think that we were at a big advantage going into this pandemic because um, it was a little bit more customized. Yes, there were some things we needed to adjust in terms of folks that were receiving computers. We were experiencing shipping delays. We were um, staggering our technology department as essential workers. So they would take turns going into the office to build the equipment and the software that we needed. Um, we had to extend our new hire notification window time so that there was plenty of time to get this stuff to our new hires and we would ship it to their home. Um, some tactical things that we've adjusted, uh, you know, the compliance with I-9s, that's been something that um, was challenging. We've been home about 90 days now 
And so um, having the ability to defer verification of authenticity of those documents, that's been huge for us. That's helped us continue with our onboarding process um, through our systems, through Workday. So the new hire can work through that with their manager. Um, the manager has a virtual call. They can take copies of their identification and help them through the systematic approach of onboarding a new hire for their first day. Um, culturally, you know, there's some things that we've had to adjust a little bit so that we can ensure that every new hire has the benefit of really still getting to meet people, getting to know our mission and values. Um, we've done things like uh, tea breaks, coffee breaks, lunch breaks, introducing our new hires to groups, which actually is a little bit more effective than relying on the new hire getting around to some of the different offices where maybe the rest of their teams are. Um, so having the virtual capability has been huge. We use Teams um, as our platform here. Um, there's a lot of good collaboration and a lot of opportunity to get that new hire introduced to a larger group than um, where maybe it took them maybe a month to meet some of those people in person. So it's been really good. I know that it's kind of, I've balanced between tactical and logistical to some of the <laughs> culture pieces, but there's a lot that happens with getting new hire started. So that's kind of some of the big changes for us. Great, thank you. And Sarah, Memic also does sort of, an, or previously did an immersion uh, uh, onboarding and, and training, right? You either Portland or Manchester, and then you set them free. So t can you tell <laughs> us a little about the changes your company has seen? Yeah. Yeah. So um, before all of this, uh, we had new hire orientation every other Monday in our Portland office. Um, regardless of where the new hire was going to be starting out of, um, we have eight office locations. And uh, before all of this, we had about 100 employees already working full-time remote. So regardless of where they were going to be, uh, we would bring them up to the Portland office. They would go through, um, you know, a combination of meetings. So department overviews, a lunch with our senior leadership team, benefit, HR paperwork, all of that kind of stuff. Um, at the end of the day, they would then go either to their manager or their training department. Um, some of our larger departments have their own training um, team that helps to onboard the new hires. So if you're talking about claims, they have five or six people dedicated to doing that. Um, so if you're talking about one of our claim associates, let's say we're hiring them in Florida, we fly them up for Portland, they spend the day in Portland, and then the next day they're in uh, Manchester for training for probably the next week or so. Um, so it depends on what department they're hired in, but um, it's either hands-on manager training after day one or uh, the training team takes over in that specific department. So, um, you know, back in March, we had to make kind of a, a big switch. Like I said, we have it every other Monday. So we um, condensed it kind of to a half day orientation. Um, it's all via WebEx, which is our video conferencing software. Um, and I, I would say, you know, one of the challenges at first was probably the logistical aspects of IT. I mean, um, this was a new process for me. It was obviously new to our IT department. They had never onboarded anyone remotely before. So, um, you know, it was a lot of collaboration between our HR team um, to make sure that we were getting all the information that we needed to get to IT so they could ship everything out and get it to them in time so that they could spend the first hour or so uh, with that new hire, getting them set up and ready to go. So I, I would say, um, I think it was a really smooth transition overall, but kind of that ongoing logistical aspect, um, we've kind of learned that onboarding one or two new hires at once is pretty easy. Um, but once you get to a bigger group of four or five, it gets a little bit, um, a little bit harder. Um, and I'm experiencing that right now. We have our interns starting on Monday and there's eight of them. Um, and that's a pretty big group. So we decided to ship out all the equipment uh, this week and they're actually meeting one-on-one -on -one with one of our tech support specialists over the phone, getting set up this week so that on Monday they're ready to go. So I really think just, you know, working through some of that stuff um, initially was kind of the harder part of it. Um, but I think we've kind of worked out a process that, that works for everyone now. Well, great. Um, one of the other reasons I wanted to talk to the three of you is that you all work for companies that have a very strong brand recognition and a strong corporate culture. And so specifically around introducing new hires to your corporate culture, can you share some of the strategies that, that you have used 
um, and you know, and how have those transitioned to be to to doing those from a, a remote on a remote basis rather than in person? And and Beth, I was going to ask you to address that first. I mean, Woodard Curran has always had a Founders Day, right? And so, um, so so tell us a little bit about how you introduce new hires to your company culture. Sure. So um, again, not a lot of significant changes. Um, it still resides largely with our management team and with that new hires um, hiring manager. But um, typically, if they were going to start in person, you know, they'd start with their desk set up. They'd have their office swag, for lack of a better term. <laughs> um, right now, we're we're mailing that to their homes, um, so they still have all of that. Uh, we continually ask for feedback from the handoff between recruiting to our onboarding por uh, point person to their hiring manager to our HR business partner. Um, there's a lot of touch points where we ask for feedback on how are they doing, what could we do better, um, what was challenging. Um, for specific segments of our business, we do have um, like a consulting 101 type of um, presentation that gets that new hire immersed in how we operate. What does it mean to work in consulting? What are the acronyms that our engineering firm use? Because there's a lot of them that I still am learning. Um, the employee manager is really uh, working through a 30, 60, 90 day plan with that new hire. And so depending on where they sit in the business, um, you know, they might be asked to engage in communities of practice where we have different water practices within our groups. Um, they might join young professionals group or our employee resource groups for diversity and inclusion. Um, the employee manager makes sure that they are, they understand, you know, our company values, um, our mission, you know, what our history has been. Founders Day is a really great um, historically in-person uh, gathering at our different office locations where the employees get to celebrate, you know, that we were founded 40 years ago. We got commemorative uh, pint glasses last year, which was great. Um, but each office kind of has a Founders Day, has a lunch, a barbecue, that kind of stuff. We're going to do it obviously a little different this year, but um, just making sure that everybody stays connected. Um, I think that's huge, making sure that people know who to go to and um, who the decision makers are and who can help them. Um, we've got mentoring. Uh, there's a program called Paying Attention to Talent. There's all kinds of groups for folks to join that help them with whatever they're thinking about then, you know, operationally, tactically, uh, just being included, just making friends, connections, sharing hobbies and interests. Um, so there's the work side of it, that's the developing and leveraging their experience and how they can contribute to what it incur in. And then there's the personal side of just, hey, you know, we want to learn about you, your family, your uh, likes and dislikes, you know, we've got um, different internal systems like our Yammer is more like a Facebook for our company. Um, just different ways to stay connected, understand news, welcome other new hires, all of that. We just got a question from one of some someone in the audience asking if you can speak a little more about the pay attention to talent program. Yeah, what is that exactly? So that is a mentoring program that we do have um, deployed regionally. And so because we have so many different office locations, um, we have volunteers that are interested in a mentoring type of uh, role. And so we match up folks that want to have a mentor, want to have a connection um, with folks that have volunteered to play that role. And then they have kind of their own path where um, Oh, sorry, it looks like my connection's a little unstable. Hence the working from home piece. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we set up and facilitate those relationships and then they take it and run with it in terms of participating in that program. So whatever the mentee is looking for out of that, um, their path in that is kind of customized. Wow, that sounds terrific. Um, Meryl, why don't you talk a little bit about what you folks are doing at Grand Rounds and don't forget to mention the pottery class because I thought that was so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, we have a strong culture, we, you know, I would say we have like 
our site culture. So for those, you know, in the office, so uh, obviously our office in Lewiston, but we also have a strong, just like corporate culture across the organization. So um, from a company wide standpoint, um, you know, we always have something called a Sunday night note where uh, whether it's our CEO or a senior member of the team or anyone on the team sends out a reflection on that week or a reflection that they've been thinking about. Um, and it's been neat. Uh, our CEO, Owen, has been turning that more into like a video um, or a podcast situation to connect with the team. And it's been a really cool change in medium and has been really well received, just makes you feel that, that personal connection um, for everyone on the team. Um, we've also been doing a lot of virtual coffees and lunches. So, you know, there's always sort of a, a quarterly random lunch that we used to do. So we're still doing those, but um, donating money to local food banks and, and instead you just eating lunch uh, in front of your computer. So it's a little bit awkward, but also fun and silly and just gives the team a chance to take a break from, from the day to day. Um, and then we also have a really strong uh, employee resource group. Uh, so we, there are about six across the organization with different focuses. Um, and so those those teams have been becoming really collaborative and, and sort of creative in terms of thinking of, of how they can reinforce messages and provide support um, while doing that, you know, sort of uh, vir through virtual uh, interactions rather than in person. Um, from a site perspective, though, as Carol mentioned, um, you know, I, I sort of have budget to use for my site uh, throughout the year just to, to do team events and since obviously the in person events aren't happening. We've shifted to other things. So um, we actually, uh, the team is getting delivered, uh, people signed up to do a pottery class. So a local, um, a local uh, group, I think based in Turner, um, is delivering basically kits to everyone on the team to decorate and then they'll, they'll fire them in a kiln and everyone can share them online or um, you know, we did, uh, we were big supporters of the Dempsey Challenge, and that's something that, that's near and dear to our heart as a healthcare organization. And so, you know, doing our own little mini, like, ice bucket challenge to raise, to continue to raise money um, for the Dempsey Challenge, so a lot of those things were in person, really kind of changing those to virtual. Um, you know, uh, team members were making salsa and delivering them to people across the team. So just these little things to still have that personal connection. Um, we, we heavily rely, it sounds like a similar system to what Beth mentioned, but on Slack, which is an internal sort of instant messaging um, technology. And that's just a wonderful way to kind of stay connected and to, to form those groups. And um, so, yeah, it's been fun to see how creative the team has gotten. Oh, that's terrific. And Sarah, talk about Mimic and don't forget to mention the senior management luncheon. Yeah, so, um, you know, first off, when I, I think of Memex culture, I think of a welcoming, supportive, collaborative, customer service oriented environment. And I think whether you're talking about a remote onboarding experience or in person, I think instilling company culture starts the day that they apply for a position. Um, you know, they, they start to see it through our HR business partners, how they're communicating with them. They start to see it when they go in for interviews or right now do a, a video interview. Mm -hmm. um, I think they start to get a sense of it uh, during the orientation process. Um, when I talk about how Memex started as a company, where we are now and where we're going in the future. Um, talking about benefits that um, support things that you know are really important to us. So Memex really invests in the community and wants to support our employees. So talking about our volunteer time off policy or our education assistance program. I think you really start to get a sense of it through, through some of that. Um, I think one of the most important things, especially in this remote environment, is our company intranet. It's called My Memic. And it's something that I think was really important before for a new hire. Um, it's a really collaborative tool and it helps to foster communication. Um, but it's, you know, their homepage when they open up Safari, whatever, Internet Explorer, Chrome, um, and it has an employee directory with org charts, pictures, um, everyone's name, phone number, title. Um, when new hires start, it's uh, posted there so that everyone can see them. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think it is part of our company culture and it showcases our company culture. There's things on the homepage with updates from, you um, you know, across the company. Right now, a lot of it's related to COVID-19 and each member of the senior leadership team um, has been emailing us each day and it gets posted there. Um, we have a monthly message from our president and CEO, Mike, and so that's there. Um, if there's training opportunities, you can sign up for them there. Um, 
during COVID-19, we've been doing, um, one of our employees is a yoga instructor, so you can sign up to do a yoga class with him. Um, for our more, you know, musically talented um, employees, we've been doing a musical happy hour, and you can join that via WebEx. Um, and then there's wait, wait, other things. I want to know more about that. Does everybody get like a piece of music and they practice and they come together for a performance? So it's, um, I, I think it started out of, um, we have an annual luncheon every year. And last year we actually had a talent show the day before. And so some of our more talented employees participated in that. Um, and a few of them kind of volunteered um, to, to put on basically a concert, I guess. Um, and so a few of them um, have done that. One of them was playing um, guitar and people just joined in. You could, you know, bring tea, whatever it was and kind of just listen and hang out. Um, so that's something that's come out of this whole thing, helping people, um, you know, collaborate and kind of have fun um, during, you know, what has been a scary time for people. Um, you wanted me to talk about one thing. What was it? Uh, oh, the senior leadership team lunch. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we used to, uh, in our normal orientation, have a senior team uh, leadership lunch with the new hires. Um, and it was really an opportunity for the team um, to answer questions and just show that they're a resource for our new, new hires. Um, they love to hear new ideas um, and you know offer suggestions, whatever it is. So um, initially back in March, when we switched to this remote onboarding process, uh, quite honestly, I thought by the end of April, beginning of May, we would hopefully be being, bringing people back to the Portland office and we'd go through a more traditional orientation. So I didn't include that. Um, and it's something I, I, I felt has been missing. So moving forward, we're going to be doing a monthly um, new hire meeting with the senior leadership team uh, via WebEx, just similar kind of thing. They can um, just get to know each other. And, um, you know, we have an open door policy and it's super important to the senior leadership team. So I'm excited to be able to add that back in. Oh, that's great. Um, so I, I had other questions, but it looks like we're getting a little compressed for time here. So let me just ask one more question. And that is, what are you taking away from this, uh, from the way that, that you have changed your process during the pandemic? Are there certain strategies that you're going to be applying that you learned during the pandemic going forward? Um, I just wonder, you know, uh, certainly innovation comes to the fore when your normal processes are disrupted. And so I wonder, are you going to um, continue with any of the things that you're doing now once things return to normal? And Meryl, I'll ask you that question first. Sure. Um, you know, I think that certainly there, you know, from our perspective, there's actually still quite a long time before things are going to return to normal for us and, and until we'll be sort of in our office. So, um, you know, I think definitely as we think about the next four to six months, we will continue sort of along this line. Um, you know, I think, I think there's probably one of the most interesting things that we've been thinking about is within my organization, largely everyone is based out of the Lewiston or the Reno office. Um, and so certainly it has expanded our horizons and, and sort of um, thinking around whether we would have remote workers as part of the, um, as part of the workforce uh, more permanently. You know, we've seen, um, we've seen really great results from the team in terms of adopting and, and um, adjusting to home. Um, and I think there are always going to be people, the, those extroverted people who really thrive off of being in an office and surrounded by people. But, um, but certainly it's been really interesting to see people um, really excel being at home. And so that's certainly something that we will be considering is just how do we think about how our workforce may shift um, more permanently. Um, and I think from a, from a training perspective um, and an onboarding perspective in, in particular, um, you know, I, I, I think we probably still would love to do in-person onboardings, um, you know, when we're able to, just because there is, you know, there is just something about being in the space of people and, um, you know, sort of being able to have lunch together in person and, and share a meal and do those sorts of things. So I think, you know, certainly that would, that would be our preference, but um, I think there are absolutely aspects that probably could be expedited or done virtually before maybe your first day on site. Um, and, and I think those are the things that we'll be um, thinking about as we as we sort of evolve that strategy once we're in the office. Cool. And how about you, Beth? So I would say um, we were 
starting to really explore more fully flexible work arrangements. We didn't have a formal policy in place and ironically, we were writing it right when this had happened. <laughs> and so of course we didn't deploy it. Um, <laughs> but I would say uh, some of the things that had caused us to be a little bit more slow um, in, in taking more policy structured action on it was um, there was still some, some resistance, you know, some of our offices uh, somewhat had a culture of, if you're not in the office, you're not working. Mm. That's a really big shift um, during this pandemic that I think um, everybody is far more supportive and tolerant. Um, people are still very productive. And in fact, I think some of the things that folks took for granted um, by having check-ins or being able to see somebody in person, um, it's actually really good because people are staying very well connected virtually now, you know, and we've got such a big uh, uh, offering, I get a set of offerings for remote support, um, for hobbies, for news, for uh, do it yourself, garden boxes, like whatever it is, um, people are very, very well connected through this time and we really haven't missed a beat. So I think that's really a good lesson learned in general for our company of just remote work arrangements, flexible work arrangements, it's all okay. And we're all trying to make sure that we're as inclusive as possible. So an example, you know, families, folks that are dealing with uh, childcare issues and schools closing and um, having to work at different ends of the day or working on the weekend, um, there's just a lot more tolerance and support for getting their work done, but just in a different way. And so that's a very large lesson that I think we'll still carry forward. Um, another piece of it is just, we were so uh, tied to our real estate, tied to our office space, you know, it, we needed to have this. And I think that's even more evident that that's not necessarily the case now. So we'll be looking at a real estate strategy over the next several years of just, you know, can we really continue to support more and more work um, remotely, virtually. If somebody's only in the office a couple days a week, like that's great. You know, maybe we don't need as much office space. So um, financially, that's a really um, good driver for us as well. Yeah, very good takeaways. Absolutely. And how about how about you, Sarah? What what's in store for Mimic? Do you think? What are the takeaways here for you? Yeah. So I think my biggest takeaway when you're you're just talking about this overall, or even just the onboarding process, is the importance of flexibility. Um, you know, we did have about 100 employees working full-time remote before this and about 180 who were part-time. Um, so we did already have some people doing that. And um, I think we've gotten more flexible, um, similar to what Beth said, you know, if, um, I don't know, if dogs are barking in the background or, you know, they have to work different hours to get things done because of childcare, um, you know, we've been much more flexible on that kind of stuff. And I could see that continuing, you know, kind of into the future. Um, maybe more employees want to work from home um, and we already have that policy in place. So I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, I think it's very split. Some employees are like, please get me back to the office. I, I want to be there. Um, other employees, maybe part-time. And then you have the ones that want to be full-time. So I think it'll be interesting to see from that perspective what changes after all of this. Um, and then with the, the onboarding process, I think it's been so important to be flexible um, and you know, constantly seeking out feedback to see what is and what isn't working. It's a completely new process um, that we're going through. And um, I've been getting some great employee feedback that I'm, I've been implementing. So um, similar to, I think, you know, both of you, you were going to be doing this for at least a couple another months. So making this process as smooth as possible um, and being flexible along the way is, you know, I think key. Great. Well, thank you. It looks like we've got questions in the queue. So Strawberry, do you want to tee up the first one, please? Yes. Uh, so we have a question from Stephen Lipman. Are any of the panelists encouraging employees to record introductory videos? If so, what guidelines do you provide to new and existing employees on what's appropriate to share on a company video? No, oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Who wants to take a first stab at that? I can. Um, so we are not encouraging them, but I love that idea. Um, that's actually a really cool thing um, to implement. What we do right now to introduce new hires to the company is 
on our internet on my memic there's a picture of them posted and um, you can click and get a little more information on them but i love that idea that's that's a pretty cool one so uh, likewise with Sarah, we don't necessarily encourage individual videos, but we do encourage um, new hires to participate in the virtual um, sessions in whatever form they are. And maybe there's an icebreaker game or some kind of an engagement activity where they're encouraged to introduce themselves, what they like and where they sit and who they're working with. Um, we do give them a little bit of guidance on just, you know, these are the things that you can expect and we'd like you to share, but um, nothing tailored to individual videos, I'd say. Same here, we, we do bios that we send out for everyone, but not individual videos introducing themselves. Great. Next uh, question. Do you have any onboarding advice for new hires who may have hearing or visual disabilities? Hmm. So I can take that. Um, in my past life, we actually had some of this, but um, it, it really was just customized. And so with our, um, with the appropriate partner, you know, with our workers comp, with our health and safety, you know, if there are um, customized things that we need to put in a place or, um, you know, whatever technology assistance um, based on what the impairment is, we would work through that. We actually have not had um, any situation that I'm aware of right now that we would need to do something uh, quite too different, but uh, definitely want to be inclusive and make sure that we're meeting that need and able to support it. Yeah, uh, same here. I haven't run into that yet, but um, we would look into whatever technology. I know in the past we've used, um, I believe it's called Dragon Software. Um, you we have as well. Yeah, you can just talk and it'll type it up for you. So some, something along those lines is, I imagine, what we would look into. Good. Next question. Uh, what other technologies are you using besides Zoom and WebEx? I know there was sort of a, I was a little awash in the acronyms for, so just in our conversation here, we heard about Yammer, we heard about Google Hangout, we heard about WebEx, we heard about, um, well, there was one more. Anyway, so yes, if you guys could sort of just take a, a quick stab at answering that question, that'd be great. So sure, I'll, I'll lead on that one. So we, um, at Grand we use um, primarily for video conferencing Google Hangouts, um, which is just through the G Suite or Google Suite of applications. It's very similar to Zoom. Um, we also use a system called Slack or software called Slack. Um, which is basically just an uh, internal instant message program, but you can um, send attachments through there, um, post videos, photos. So it's like, um, you know, it enables both social and work uh, really effectively. Um, I'd say those are, those are the biggest things that we use. And then obviously, um, you know, all, we, we use uh, the Google suite for, for actual processing and then some internal systems that we use as well, but those are the biggest ones. Yeah, uh, we use uh, Jabber. It's a soft phone and instant messaging software. So um, everyone has a phone on their computer, which has been you know super helpful throughout this whole transition. And then we use WebEx, which is our internal and external video conferencing software. And we um, transitioned recently from Skype for business. So all of our phone calls and meetings were through Skype. So no one had a landline and then they would use their cell phone. Um, we transitioned to Microsoft Teams fully. It was a little challenging to have both platforms um, because some people were using one and not the other. Um, Teams has been great because it's very collaborative. You can share files, you can all be in the same document. Um, a lot like Google Hangouts, but uh, the privacy and uh, the features around Teams has been really helpful for how we conduct business, um, how we have our meetings. And I would say, um, you know, we've got like a, the cell phone capability of marrying up and being able to use Teams through your phone. Um, we also have for our um, intranet, I mentioned Yammer is what we call kind of our Facebook for our internal. We have uh, a, an intranet SharePoint site called Compass that is where you can find anything and everything around Woodard and Curran, the directory locations, news articles, all of those things. So 
Um, we're pretty well connected technology wise, um, but everything is kind of centralized through those platforms. Have any of you had security issues with, with the systems, the communication platforms that you're using? No, Sarah's shaking her head, Meryl. <laughs> no. Good, good. Next question, Strawberry. Uh, have you addressed the potential for video conferencing fatigue or overload? <laughs> yes, we uh, we have reminded people that um, since their home life and work life is blurred a little bit now to make sure that they should take breaks, they should still continue to try to take time off, step off their desk and go outside or go do things. Uh, the mental health break, you know, and that's been really challenging sometimes with our virtual happy hours and things because maybe people don't really want to get on the phone after they've been on the phone in meetings all day. So it's just quick reminders. We really, really promote our well-being dashboard um, and just, you know, how to take care of yourself, take stretch breaks, go do yoga, you know, all of those things. Yeah, and I think it's actually, we've seen people not taking time off because it's sort of like, what are you going to do, you know, like that vacation's canceled. And so, um, you know, especially right now moving into the summer, really actually trying to like force people to take time away from work because I think we are, you know, it's, this has been such a long slog and I think people are really, really feeling it. And so um, trying to, trying, trying to really strongly encourage that time away and time off, even if it's an afternoon off um, or a morning off, especially as people are balancing childcare and their families and work and it's just it's a lot so um so we've been working with that and same same thing as Beth mentioned stretch breaks and you know sort of just time away from your computer um so yeah Definitely yeah that. similar to both we're encouraging everyone you know to take PTO during this time even if it's just a day you hang out outside in your backyard um we also do 10 and two um, stretch breaks. And uh, before it used to be over our loudspeaker from our receptionist. Now she sends out um, funny videos and emails to the whole company reminding everyone to get up and stretch and go walk around for 10 minutes, so. Cool. Um, Beth, could you maybe just speak a little more about your well-being dashboard? That's an intriguing idea. Sure. So. Um, we have so many different options. It's almost like a menu. Um, there's all kinds of things in there. Uh, we obviously have our employee assistance program, but we also have um, a, a, an app called Virgin Pulse. So you can hook up your Fitbit or whatever device you're using to track your steps. Um, there's reward programs for eating healthy, losing weight, staying active. Um, also as part of our well-being, it's, you know, different videos or trainings or clips on anything, mental health, mental wellness, um, you know, even just how to go about your day in this new day and age. Um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about recently from the leadership team, um, we stay connected every couple of weeks with uh, a company-wide call. And so um, one of the things recently is employee managers, you know, staying connected with your employee knowing what their personal circumstances might be. So maybe they drop off between 10 and two because of childcare. And uh, maybe they wanna really sign off at five o'clock because they've had such a long day. So as part of well-being in general, just making sure that managers are aware of what personal parameter at 10 o'clock and expecting and unstable again, apparently, but expecting a, a response. Um, a lot of it just is the whole view on what an employee goes through. You know, uh, we've got, I think we had an origami session, origami making session or something, you know, just different things for people to be interested in and think about other than work as well. well so it supplements great. all of that other stuff. That's terrific. Um, and we have one more question to wrap up our session. So Strawberry, tee that up, please. Uh, this one's from Lisa Whited. Are you providing ergonomic setups or ergonomic evaluations for people in their home offices? Well, we better make Memic answer that one. <laughs> yeah, so um, as you know, standard, uh, when we were doing our in-person orientation, all new hires receive an ergonomic evaluation. Um, employees who are full-time remote get a $500 setup stipend so that they can purchase, um, uh, you know, a sit-stand desk, an ergonomic chair, that kind of stuff. Um, but 
when we do the ergonomic evaluations, we have trained ergo reps. Um, and if someone's having a more severe problem, we would have someone in loss control um, do their ergonomic evaluation. But we would provide, um, you know, equipment that they need. Um, right now, our loss control team has been trying to work through using things that you have at home. So maybe your monitor isn't high enough. So we'll just have you stack a couple books underneath. So we've been trying to do some of that stuff. Um, but we've always been, um, you know, open to providing roller mouses, whatever type of mouse or keyboard or, you know, any specialized equipment um, that they might need. So we've definitely, um, that was very important to us and our loss control team, I believe they called every single employee when we went to the, uh, you know, 99% remote uh, they called every employee to say, hey, are you, are you good? Do you need any help with anything? Um, so they really checked in on everyone to make sure when we switched this whole remote situation that everyone was okay. Great. And how about with, um, with Grand Rounds and with Woodard Curran? Yeah, so um, when we started, when it you know, became clear that we were, were asking people to not go into the office, we, everyone got a $250 sort of one-time stipend to set up their home office. Um, they were able to, you know, you were able to grab your chair from, from the office. You had a nice desk chair, um, but that was really to make sure you had the right setup that you needed at home. Um, and then, yeah, we'll do virtual evaluations uh, if needed. And then if someone needs additional um, equipment or support, we'll, you know, coordinate that on a one-off basis, one by one basis. Okay. And Beth, how about with you? Uh, we have the one-off support. Um, we have an ergonomic lead in um, our health and safety team that helps troubleshoot, but we also assign um, through Beth, are you there? Health and safety. It's called <laughs> Peer Safety. Walks I'm here. <laughs> so we have a module called peer safety that pushes out an ergonomic training. So it's not about what they have available to them. It's about, are you looking at your material and not looking up or looking down, you know, is everything within, you know, reachable distance. Um, so we have that, that we've pushed out to everybody um, in recent events as well. Wow. That's great. You, you all work for terrific companies. I, I've been very impressed with the, uh, uh, just the holistic approach that you're taking uh, with bringing people into your companies and making sure that they're taken care of. So uh, congratulations to you all. If we were in our normal, you know, our normal setting for our business breakfast forums, you would hear thunderous applause right now from everyone in the audience. So uh, just imagine that you can hear everyone clapping and, um, and I thank you very much for your time.